My name is Bob Takano. I'd like to welcome you to Takano Athletics. This particular gym has been open since June, and uh, what we are here for is to try and get the sport of weightlifting and the practices that go into developing weightlifters uh, better well known and introduced to a larger audience than it's had before. The reason that we decided to put this series of, of seminars together is because the typical uh, weekend or one day weightlifting seminar is really not very effective. Basically what we do and that is we show you th some things and then we give you some homework and if you do the homework you benefit from it and if you don't do the homework then you know it's you just spend a day listening to somebody talk. So uh, what, what I'm going to do here is we're going to go into a little bit more depth so that you understand why we're giving you the homework and what we do is we're doing about one a month and so you can take the information that we give out go home do the homework and then come back next month and and learn something new so if you follow this series all the way through uh, we're going to touch on all of the relevant topics that are necessary for you to improve as a weightlifter or as a weightlifting coach this week's topic is going into the bottom one of the first sessions that I did, uh, we talked about the bottom position per se for snatch, for clean, and for jerk. And we went over the exercises to teach you how those are supposed to feel. And if you are an athlete or you're a coach, it's absolutely essential that you be able to feel what it's supposed to be like when you're in the correct position. So I'll, I'll be talking a lot about that. This one is slightly different in that we are concerned with how fast you can go into the bottom. So having a great bottom position that you can get into very slowly is not all there is to the bottom position. Once you understand what it feels like, where all of your body parts are supposed to be, then the important thing is how fast can you get there, okay? Now, to give you a little bit of background on this, back in the 1970s, uh, the Bulgarians were looking for ways in which they could improve the performance of their athletes. And one of the things that they did, they, they did a lot of uh, biomechanical studies, and they figured out that there were, there were two things that had to be improved as far as speed goes. The first one was how fast you move the bar. The second one was how fast you move your body, okay? So I'm gonna address those two topics. Let's talk about these speed components. The first one is bar speed. Bar speed simply has to do with how quickly you can get the bar moving. Now, what they did in the Bulgarian study was they found out that bar speed had not improved significantly over the years. Even though people were lifting more and more weight at the international level, the speed of the bar was not improving significantly. But what they did find out was that the most successful weightlifters were moving faster and faster under the bar. And there are a few technical aspects of that, and there's also some training aspects that have to be taken into consideration. So what we are concerned with today in this particular seminar is the speed of movement. How fast can you move? And uh, I'm finding this to be a problem, and I, I don't want to offend anybody, but uh, if you're in the, the older crowd, the master's crowd, and I think a lot of you are, uh, and I'm finding this with, with um, people that are coming to me that haven't been weightlifters. Uh, they're having the greatest problem at speed going under the bar. I haven't figured out why, but I think part of it has to do with the older you are, the more injuries you have, and the more adaptations that you've made in your movement patterns. And as a result, those things kind of inhibit you from going under. And it seems to be more of a problem in the snatch than in the clean or in the jerk. Today, we're gonna to talk about what you're supposed to be doing to move under quickly, and then give you some exercises that are gonna train you. The snatch is the quickest of the lifts simply because the amount of weight that you should be lifting in the snatch is going to be about 80% of what you lift in the clean and jerk. And so you're going to be able to make the weight move relatively quickly in the snatch. And, the, and uh, truth be told, and I say this all the time to my athletes, speed of pull 
translates into height. Okay, so if you can get a lot of speed on the bar coming out of the power position, the bar is gonna go up high. But if you don't get a lot of speed, but you still manage to get height on it, you may not have enough time to get under. So we're concerned with two things. How much speed can you get? Because that's gonna buy you time to get under. And then how fast you get under, all right? And when you, the day comes that you make the heaviest snatch that you ever make, when you PR for the high, heaviest weight that you ever make, it's because you got all of those things right, all right? The better lifter you are, the more frequently you're gonna get those, those two things right. And if you're an elite level lifter, if you're extremely proficient, you do it all the time, okay? The rest of us that are not quite as talented, not quite as proficient, we get it every once in a while, okay? So how well you do really is a question of how often you can do it well, all right? And the best lifters are gonna do it well all the time. All right, we're gonna start out uh, this video, um, this is Carla Hernandez, and she was the winner of the American Record Makers competition. She's actually won it for the last, I think, three years, and uh, she was a member of the Mexican National Junior Team, and this isn't a perfect snatch that you're going to see in this video, but uh, it's, uh, I selected it because it does have some flaws but we're gonna take a look at those and see what she does as she's going under. So we're gonna look at it first as a video. And, and one, of the, one of the lessons that I hope you'll take away from this is you shouldn't be watching video all the time because you can't see everything in video, especially if your eye is not trained. So if you've only been in the sport a couple of years and you've been watching video, your eye is still probably not sharp enough to see everything that happens in real time. So I'm gonna show you the video first and then we're gonna break it down into sequence shots. When I was coming up as a coach, advanced technology was sequence photos. And, and it was right after they got motor drives on cameras. And so we, we got to see a lot of those. And what we learned to do was to look for the correct positions. And we figured out what were the ideal positions. So if you're coaching, I would suggest that you spend some time watching sequence photos so that you know exactly what to look for. All right, so let's, let's take a look at this. Okay, now, she's, she's a good technician. Um, her, her stepdad was the national junior coach of Cuba, I think, and then he came over to work in Mexico. Uh, so she's been coached since she was a little kid. And, and she's pretty good. And that was, a, that was an almost uh, maximum lift for her. Let me talk a little bit about maximum lifts or as you approach your maximum lift. If you are a very, very good lifter, well-trained, and you're perfectly balanced, your lifts look identical as you're going up and you approach 100%. They might start getting a little bit awkward looking at about 98% of max and maybe a little bit worse at 99%, and there might be a, a kind of a flaw that's visible at 100%, okay? If you are not so well trained, and your body has not been balanced, and your training has not been designed properly, your lifts start to get ugly looking at about 87%, 88%, and they gradually deteriorate, and then when you get up to 100%, you might make that maybe one out of every five tries, okay? So it's a matter of consistency. Um, so sh this lift for her is probably around 99%. So there are some little technical flaws in it. Okay, so let me, let me run this through once again. See what you can see in this lift. If you're a coach, you're gonna to have to watch a lift like that in real time and tell exactly what was wrong with it. And then you, you have to be able to tell your athletes what they need to do to fix that, okay? And if it's in the heat of battle, if it's in a competition, you've got, and they've got another attempt coming up, you've gotta be able to tell them what correction to make right on the spot. And everything is speeded up in the meet and you've got to know exactly what to tell them 
to do to fix that, to make a better lift on the next attempt, okay? So that means you have to watch a lot of lifting. Um, and it takes a while and there's no way to speed it up. You just have to watch a lot of lifting, okay? Hopefully a lot of good lifting. This is her extension, which is pretty good extension. You can see that her heels are not that high off the floor. If you don't get your heels up off the floor, then you can't completely extend your knees and your hips, all right? So there's, uh, there's some folks running around saying you're supposed to stay on your heels, you're supposed to lift on your heels. If you do that, you can't completely extend your knees and hips. She's got her heels slightly off the floor. Her body is almost vertical. She's shrugged and she's putting some arm pull. The pull is going so that the bar is moving as fast as it possibly can. The thing is, how do you get from that position into the bottom position quickly? All right, and there's a number of things that have to happen. And that's the first one right there. That her feet are coming up off the floor. And if we go back, notice where her feet are. And then right there, if you look, you can see that the shadow under her foot indicates that her foot is off the ground. Uh, there are two reasons to move your feet, okay? The stance that you take when you pull should be with your feet under your hips, and then that way the forces are going straight up. Okay, that's the best place to put your feet when you're pulling. But to squat under the bar, that's not the best position. Almost all of us have to move our feet out slightly and then maybe even turn the toes out slightly. So in order to be in a stable position to receive the bar, you have to move your feet. The second reason, and a lot of people aren't really aware of this, is when you lift your foot up right at the top of the pull, then what you do is you relax the muscles that are straightening your hip, and you now allow yourself to be in a position to rapidly contract the muscles that flex your hips, all right? And and the speed at which you can flex your hips is very critical to going under the bar, okay? So the reasons to move your feet are to move them out to where you can receive the bar most effectively and to kind of unlock your hips so that you can flex the hips to go under. I also need to make a, a comment right here. When your arms are in this position, you cannot use your arms to pull yourself under. And there is a, people are talking about something called a third pull. Uh, on all the EMG studies that you do on the arms of the muscle while they're pulling, there's indication that there's very little activity going on to pull the bar or to pull yourself under the bar. Okay, so at this point, the factors that are gonna allow you to move under are how fast you can drop under and how fast you can flex your hips. So the most critical thing is how fast can you flex your hips? All right, her feet have moved out to the position where she's gonna receive. This position right here is very critical. You see that she's got a lot more distance where she can drop. So the bar is pulled plenty high enough. The second factor, the first one being flexion of the hips, the second factor is pushing yourself under the bar. And her arms are, are in position here. They're close to the right position. Uh, where she can now push herself down. For most lifters in competition, this weight is gonna be heavier than the athlete. So you can actually use the bar to push yourself lower. So there's two things going on. Hips are flexing and she's gonna be pushing herself under. Now, when you are, and some of you probably when you were learning the snatch, you might have experienced this phenomenon where you, the bar takes off from here, and I think somebody made a cartoon about it. The bar takes off from here, and then you go under, and you don't know where the bar is until it's coming down on you. How many of you have experienced that? Because I did. And if you, you, the bar took off and then you didn't know where it was, then you went down into a squat, and then all of a sudden it appeared out of the sky. Okay. If you are doing something to the bar, then you know where it is. So if we, can, if we can eliminate or shorten, minimize those times when we're not acting on the bar, then we, we have a greater amount of time that we know where the bar is. So right now she knows where the bar is because she's using it to push herself down. 
Okay, and there was only a very small amount of time when she wasn't doing anything to the bar. Okay, so, and that small amount of time was actually the amount of time it took for her going from here and then moving her feet out to where it landed. So it was the amount of time it took for her feet to move out. Now her arms have locked. This phase right here, the technical term for it, is the amortization phase, which means she's now trying to slow down the momentum of the bar as it's coming down. And if you do this effectively, you're gonna have control of the bar. Some people get to this point and they don't know how to tighten up everything, and that includes the torso. If you can't tighten up the torso and the rhomboids, which are in the middle of your back between your shoulder blades, if those don't tighten up and that whole chain going from the middle of your back all the way up through your elbows doesn't, doesn't tighten up, then you're not gonna support the weight. So even though you got the weight up, it was moving fast, you went under, you were moving fast, but if you can't tighten up everything at the right time, then you're gonna, you're gonna lose the weight. And you can't be off, you can't be late by even fractions of a second. Okay, and all of that has gotta, has gotta take place. So she's got the bar there, she's in amortization phase, and right there she's secured the bar underneath. And the heavier the weight becomes, the slower the speed of the bar, and the less time that you have to get to that position and do it right. Okay, so that's what we're concerned with in the snatch, is how do we get down to this position from this position. So now she's got the bar, it's completely locked out. By the way, notice this is something that I coach, and I think you're gonna see it with all of the top lifters. The wrists are bent back up at the top. They're not like this. If they're like this, you're lifting the weight higher than you need to by a little bit, but it's gonna make a difference, all right? And the other thing is, if your wrists are bent back, then your elbows are in the correct position. Shoulders and elbows are in the correct position to push, okay? If you're like this and you push, then you're gonna push yourself back out from under, all right? So we don't wanna, we don't wanna do like this, we wanna do like that, okay? And if I'm walking around and I'm coaching today and I see you doing this, I'm gonna say, hello kitty hands, because that's what it looks like. Whenever, you've seen those cartoons where they have Hello Kitty lifting away. Hello Kitty is always lifting like this, incorrectly. <laughs> this is just a drill where you practice getting up on your toes, moving your feet out to where you squat. That's the slowed down version. Okay, you can, you can use that with your beginners. They want, you want them to go up on toes and then move their feet out to where they squat. If I have somebody that's new and they really have a hard time feeling that, I'm gonna ask them to do it with eyes closed. Uh, and, and please, uh, if you have people that you're working with beyond the first time, they should not be looking at their feet to see where their feet are, okay? They need to feel where their feet are. All right, and that's what makes you an athlete. If you have to look at your body parts to know where they are, you're not an athlete, okay? If you watch, uh, you watch great athletes doing what they do, they're not looking at their hands and feet. They can feel where their hands and feet are. So one of the purposes of this drill is to try to get you used to feeling where your feet are supposed to be and what they're supposed to be doing. Now, the trouble with this is, um, and I did it for the video, is he's staying up in, in this extended position too long. All right, what you wanna eventually do is get it so that you go up and then move your feet out. Okay, so there's, there shouldn't be that little, uh, it's less than a second. It's actually a few milliseconds that he's up there, but when you actually do it in the course of a snatch, it's gotta be instantaneous. You go up and then your feet move and you need to get the full plantar flexion before you move your feet. All right, this is an exercise, uh, track people are probably familiar with this. This is an exercise to develop speed and hip flexion. These are leg throws, you need to do them with a partner. And what these are gonna get you to do is to uh, 
develop basically your psoas muscles, which are gonna be flexing your hips uh, to function a lot faster. Now the guy on the bench is supposed to be trying to bring his legs up as fast as he can, and then the person on the top is gonna catch him and yield a little bit and then push him back. So it's plyometric, all right? So it's, it's basically, it's a plyometric hip flexion. So it's this hip.